the bell icon to turn on notifications. So now that we have a clean data set and we know what the difference is between an Excel table and a pivot table, it's time for us to put this data into an Excel table. Now what I've done here is I've saved this clean version of the file as sales analysis clean. So if you want to pick up the course at this point and start out with a clean data set, then you can download this file from the course files folder. If you've simply been working on the sales analysis workbook and you've followed through every single step so far, you should be at this point as well. So how do we put this data into a table? Well, there are a couple of different ways that we can do this, as is always the way in Microsoft. There's always multiple different ways of doing the same thing. The first thing you need to make sure is that you are clicked somewhere within your data. Doesn't matter which cell, just anywhere, as long as it's within your data set. Now, if I want to put this into a table, the first method I could use is to go up to the Home tab. And then in the Styles group, I have a drop down here that says Format as Table. And you can see this shows me all of the different table styles. Now, the colors that you're seeing in here, these are determined by whatever theme you're using in Excel. And if we just go off and take a look at the theme that I'm using, we can find that on the Page Layout tab. In the first group just here, if I click Themes, I'm using the Office theme, which is the default for Excel. If I was using one of these other themes, so let's say Gallery, for example, you can see that changes the font that I'm using, but it's also going to change the colors of the table styles in this drop down as well. So if you're looking at this drop down menu and thinking to yourself, well, I have completely different colors. Why is that? It's going to be because of the theme that you're using. So if you want to make sure that it's exactly the same as mine, change your theme to the Office theme. Now, with all that said, let's go back to our format as table drop down. Notice that our table styles are divided down into different groups. We have custom at the top, light, medium, and dark at the bottom. And this is really personal preference. Whichever one of these you choose, it's going to apply that particular style to your data set. So if I was to choose something like this one just here, light gray table, style medium eight, I can say, yes, my table has headers, click on OK, and I get a very dark looking table style. Notice that as soon as I put my data into a table, I now get that table design ribbon. If I decide I don't particularly like this table design, I can simply go to the table styles drop down and switch it for something else. And you'll see as I hover over, I'm getting a live preview as to what each one of these is going to look like. Now notice at the top underneath custom, I have a table style just here. And this is one that I've created for myself. It's a custom table style. And if you have a specific way that you want your table to look, you can create your own table style by clicking new table style at the bottom. Now, I'm not going to get into that now. And because you're not going to have access to the custom table style that I've created, I'm going to choose something that we can all use. So let's go for this one just here, blue table style, medium six and click to apply. So that is the first way that you can apply a table style by clicking the Format as Table dropdown and selecting one of the options. Now I'm going to Control Z just to go back a few steps to our plain data and show you an even quicker way of putting your data into an Excel table. Make sure you're clicked in the data and press the Control T keyboard shortcut. You get this little Create Table dialog box. Yes, my table has headers. Click on OK. And it's basically going to apply the default table style. And of course, if you don't like that formatting, you can choose another style from this drop down. So let's reapply our blue table style medium six. So those are the two methods you can use. Now, once you've converted your data and put it into a table, as I said, you're going to get this additional table design ribbon at the top. Now, from here, we have some table style options and I can toggle these off and on and change the way that my table style looks. So if I deselect header, it's going to remove that header row. Now, that's not particularly useful, so I'm going to put that back on. If I want to add a total row at the bottom, I could toggle that on and it's going to jump me all the way down to the last row. It's going to add a total row and I can see if I expand this column, it's not quite wide enough, it's going to give me the total profit. 
Now, I'm not really interested in that at this stage because we're going to be able to calculate this when we put it in a pivot table. So let's just turn off total row. Control up arrow to jump to the top. Now currently you can see that this table style includes banded rows, which means we have a blue row, then a white row, a blue row, then a white row, so on and so forth. If I want to turn that off, I just need to deselect banded rows and I get something that looks a lot cleaner. And I actually quite like it like this. I can choose to add a specific style to the first column only. And if I scroll across, you can see that it's going to make everything in that first column bold. Don't particularly like that. Let's turn it off. I could do the same for the last column. So it's going to apply some formatting, in this case, bold formatting to the last column only. And if I want to, I can choose to have banded columns, which is going to give me basically something similar to banded rows, except down the columns. Now I'm going to turn that off because I don't particularly want that. And then the final thing we have here is the filter button. If you remember, I said automatically when you apply a table style, you're going to get these drop down filters. And I find these really useful if I quickly want to run a sort on my data or maybe filter the items in this particular column, I can use this drop down filter. But if you don't want them there, if you're not going to do anything like that, you can deselect filter button and it's going to remove them from those column headings. I'm going to keep mine because I do like to use those. Now, the external table data group, we're not going to use in this particular course. So I'm going to skip over that because it's not actually relevant to what we're doing. The next group, the tools group, this is where we can come to create a pivot table. We can remove duplicates from here. We've already done that, but we could do it from here. And we also have a convert to range button. So if you put your data into a table and then you decide that you basically want to take it out of the table and just have it as plain data, if you select convert to range, that's going to remove the table from your data. And then finally, we have the properties group. And all we really have in here is a couple of options, the first one being table name. Now, when you put your data into a table, Excel is automatically going to give that table a generic name. So you'll probably see something up here that says table one, table two, table three, something like that. Now you can keep those table names, but I would advise you to give your table a meaningful name because that makes it a lot easier for you to identify this particular set of data. If you can imagine if you have a workbook that has maybe 20 sheets and they all have Excel tables on them, if you want to quickly jump between your tables or maybe use your table data in a formula, when your tables are named just one, two, three, four, it's very difficult to know which one you're referencing. So I always like to give my table a meaningful name. So I'm going to call this sales underscore data. Now it's worth noting here when you're naming your tables, you can't have any spaces in the name. So you need to separate words with an underscore or make them all one word. Remember to hit the enter key so that that table name sets. And then underneath that, we have a resize table option. Now, I don't need to do any resizing just here. I am happy with the way that it looks. So now that I have my data in an Excel table, I have it formatted as I like it, and I've given my table a meaningful name. Finally, we finish preparing our data ready for analysis with a pivot table. And that's exactly what we're going to get onto in the next section. Hello everyone and welcome back to the course. In this section, we're going to take a look at how we put together a pivot table. Yes, finally, after a whole section on cleaning data, we've made it to the part where we actually create a pivot table. And we're going to start out in this lesson by taking a look at something called recommended pivot tables. Now, if you notice, the worksheet that I'm working in currently is called recommended underscore pivot underscore tables dot XLSX. And you'll find this file in the course files folder. And this file is basically just the clean version of our data. So if you haven't followed along all of the lessons in the previous section, you can simply open this one up and you're good to go for the next section. So now that we have our data in a table, let's take a look at recommended pivot tables. Now you'll find these on the insert tab. In the tables group at the beginning, notice we have two different options. We have pivot table 
And then we have recommended pivot tables. So what exactly is this option? Well, if we take a look at the screen tip, it says, want us to recommend pivot tables that summarize your complex data. Click this button to get a customized set of pivot tables that we think will best suit your data. So that's exactly what it does. If we click this button, what we're going to get is this little pop-up window. And let's just widen that out a little bit. That is going to recommend the pivot tables that Excel has determined are best for our data. So it's basically taken a look at our data and now it's suggesting different ways that we can organize that data using a pivot table. And in general, you'll find the one that's most appropriate for your data will be nearer the top of this list. And you can see that we have quite a few different recommendations. So the first one that I'm clicked on here, if I was to select this, it's basically going to create a pivot table for me and it's going to arrange my data in the following way. So here I can see that it's going to list out all of the regions and then it's going to give me the sum of the unit price. So if the analysis that I wanted to do was I wanted to see the unit price broken down by region, this would be a really nice quick way for me to create that pivot table. If we take a look at the second one down, this is summarized in a different way. So again, it's using the regions as my row labels, but this time it's doing a sum of the unit cost. The next one is different again. This time we have our row labels and I can see that these are grouped. Now, again, I don't want to jump too far ahead. But just know that when you have these little plus signs next to an item in your pivot table, it means that grouping is applied. And here, if I was to select this one, it's going to show me the basically the total profit for each region, the total unit cost and the total unit price. So if this is the type of information I'm interested in, again, that would be a great one to select. And I can carry on going through. So let's take a look at the next one because this is different again. This time it's showing me a summary in a slightly different way. So this time it's using the item type as the row labels. And then we have a sum of the revenue, a sum of the total cost, and then a sum of the total profit. And that's basically what each one of these are. It's showing me different ways that I could arrange this data and analyze it. And which one I choose is very much going to be determined by the type of information that I'm looking to get out of this pivot table. So with this one, for example, if I'm really interested in seeing the sum of the unit price for each of the item types, I would choose this one. And let's use this as our example. If I was to select this and click on OK, what Excel does is it gives me a new worksheet. So you can see it's just got the generic name of sheet two currently, and it automatically creates that pivot table for me. So it means that I haven't had to build this table myself from scratch because effectively I've used a little template. And that is what recommended pivot tables are. Now, just because you use one of these, it doesn't mean that you have to keep it in this particular format. I could choose to change the fields that I'm summarizing or move fields around. And again, we're going to get onto that in the following lessons. For the time being, I'm going to delete out this worksheet. And I just very quickly want to go back into recommended pivot tables because something else that you have in here is you do have the option right at the bottom to create a blank pivot table. So if you want to start from scratch and define what fields you're using in your pivot table, you can just click blank pivot table at the bottom just here. Again, Excel is going to create a brand new worksheet, but it's going to show us a blank pivot table, which we can then build using our fields on the right hand side. And this is pretty much exactly what we're going to do in the next lesson. I'm going to show you the different ways that you can create a blank pivot table, and then we're going to start adding in fields to analyze our data. So now that we've seen how to create a pivot table using recommended pivot tables, let's take a look at how we create one from scratch. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. Now, one of the methods you can use is pretty much what we did in the last lesson. We can click in our data in our table. In this case, jump up to the insert ribbon. And in that first group, we have an option for pivot table. 
Now if we click this, it's going to take us to the Create Pivot Table dialog box. And there's a couple of things that we need to check in here before proceeding. So the first thing you'll see in here is it says, choose the data that you want to analyze. And then we have a couple of different options. We have select a table or range or use an external data source. We also have a third option here, which is currently grayed out. So it's not available to me of use this workbooks data model. Now notice the first option here has automatically been selected for me by Excel. And if you notice underneath, it says table range, and then it says sales data. Now, because I was clicked in my Excel table data, when I clicked on the pivot table button, Excel has assumed that the data that I want to use in my pivot table is basically everything that surrounds where I'm clicked. And because we named that table sales data, it's picked up the sales data table. So in this case, this is exactly what we want to use. However, before we move on, let's just explore this second option of use an external data source. Now you would use this option if maybe you have data stored somewhere else. So outside of this particular workbook. So you might have that data stored in an access table, or maybe you have it stored in just another Excel file. If that is the case, if you want to use that data in your pivot table, you can click on choose connection, browse for more at the bottom, and it's going to open up your local drives and you can go in and select the file that you want to import. So that is what that second option is all about. Now we're going to use the first option because we want to use this table data. The next thing that we have to tell Excel is where we want this pivot table report to be placed. And again, we have three different options. We can choose to put our pivot table on a brand new worksheet. We can choose to add it to an existing worksheet. And if I was to select this option underneath, it says location, and this is going to allow me to basically select a specific worksheet in my workbook. Now I only have one worksheet and that is called sales data. But if I had another one listed down here, I could choose to place that data on that particular worksheet. I could even choose to put my pivot table on the sales data worksheet. Now I wouldn't recommend that you do that. It's always good to get into the habit of separating out your data from your analysis. So always have your raw data set, your source data on a different worksheet to your pivot tables and your pivot charts. So in general, the option that I tend to select here is new worksheet. Now, once again, there is a third option where we can choose to add this data to the data model. Now, again, because this is a beginner's course, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole. But this option here basically allows you to combine different data sets into one. So if I had four Excel tables containing data, I could add them all to the data model and then create pivot tables based off of that. But for the time being, we're going to stick with new worksheet. Let's click on OK. Now notice at the bottom straight away, Excel has created me a brand new worksheet. It's called sheet five. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move this worksheet to the right hand side of my data source just for readability. So I just need to click and drag and drop to do that. What I'm also going to do is rename this worksheet. So let's right click rename and I'm going to call this, let's just call it pivot table for now so that we don't get confused. We can always come back at a later stage and make that more meaningful once we know what our pivot table is going to contain. And what you're looking at on this worksheet is basically a blank pivot table report. You can see over here, we just have this sort of little rectangle that says pivot table 13 to build a report, choose fields from the pivot table field list. And over on the right hand side, you can see the pivot table field list. And I'm going to talk to you a bit more about exactly what this is in the next lesson. But that is kind of how you get started creating your pivot table. Now, what I want to do here is just show you another method that you can use. So I'm going to right click and let's just delete out this worksheet and go back to our data source. Now, instead of going to the insert ribbon, you can also create a pivot table from the table design ribbon. And you'll notice here in the tools group, we have summarize with pivot table. And this is basically going to take you to exactly the same create pivot table dialog box. 
So once again, I want to use this sales data table range and I want to place it on a new worksheet. So all I need to do is click on OK and I have exactly the same thing. I can move my worksheet, right click and rename this pivot table and hit enter. So very straightforward and simple to start creating your pivot table from your Excel table data. In this section of the course, we're going to shift our focus from pivot tables to pivot charts because these two really do go hand in hand. A lot of the time, once you've created a pivot table to analyze your data, you're going to want to present that data visually using a pivot chart. As we know, a picture speaks a thousand words and sometimes it's a lot easier to make sense of data when it's displayed in a chart. Now I will say when you're thinking about putting together a chart, you really need to consider the data that you want to display and only display the data that is relevant. And not all charts are created equally. For example, something like a pie chart or a donut chart tends to work better for smaller data sets. Whereas if you have time-based data, which we do here, we're looking at values over two years, 2018 and 2019. These in general are best displayed with something like a line chart. Now, currently, if I want to put the data that I have in this pivot table into a chart, my chart is going to be quite chaotic looking. So let's take a look at that first of all, and then we'll explore better ways of working with pivot charts. So once you've created your pivot table, simply click in it, go up to the pivot table analyze ribbon and over in the tools group, we have a pivot chart button. And this is going to open up the insert chart dialog box. And there are many, many different chart types in Excel. And these chart types are divided down into different categories. And each category has many different iterations of that style of chart. Now, if you click on one of these categories, and you get a message like this, it means that based on your data, Excel can't produce this type of chart. Now, as I said, this isn't ideal chart information. Because it is time-based data, if I go to line chart and just select to insert one of those, take a look at what we get. Now, I'm gonna drag this out. It's doing a pretty good job of displaying it, but take a look at what we've got down here. We kind of have it split down premium luxury standard, premium luxury standard, so on and so forth. And because I have quite a bit of data, it means that this chart ends up being quite wide. In order to display this effectively, I would really need to stretch this out quite far. I couldn't have it sort of like that on the page because then no one can see the information clearly. Now I could very well just make it wider and display it like that. That isn't too much of a problem in this case but I might want to take a look at the data that I'm choosing to display and refine my data before putting it into a chart. So let's delete out the chart, just pressing delete on my keyboard. Maybe I look at this data and I think to myself, you know what, actually I'm gonna rearrange this a little bit. So maybe I want to present a chart to some key stakeholders and they're only really interested in seeing the gross sales per country by year. They're not really interested in the breakdown of the products. So I'm gonna make some changes to my pivot table. I'm going to remove the product field and I'm also going to remove the range field as well. So now I'm simply left with a list of countries and the years. And this is a much more manageable data set to put into a chart. So now if I go back to pivot table analyze and click on pivot chart, I could choose something like a column chart, or maybe I want to go back to a line chart and display it in that way. Now I think in this case, I'm gonna choose a column chart and click on OK. Now what about if I have my data organized in a different way again? So let's delete out this chart. What I'm gonna do here is we're going to remove year. I'm going to drag country into columns, and this time I'm gonna drag month name down into rows. Now it might be that I'm only interested in displaying the top five months. So the top five months with the most gross sales. So what we can do here is we can right click and we can apply a filter. Now if we go down to filter, I have a top 10 filter in here. So if I'm only interested in the top five by gross sales, I can take this down to five 
I can see items by total gross sales. Click on OK. And now I can put this data into a pivot chart. Let's go to Analyze, Pivot Chart. And this time I'm going to go for a line chart. Click on OK. And I have my data represented in a different way. So the point I'm really trying to make here when you're thinking about putting your data into a pivot chart is not only think about what is important to display in the chart, but also think about what is the most appropriate chart type. Hello everyone and welcome to this video tutorial on creating a dynamic chart label using slices and the new text join function in Excel 2019. Now a dynamic chart title is basically a title which updates depending on what you have selected. And in this example, I'm going to be making my selections from a slicer. So I have a spreadsheet here in front of me and I have a pivot table that's showing some product categories and the total sales for those categories. And from that pivot table, I've created a very simple pivot chart. And this pivot chart has a title, but currently that title just says total. What I also have on this spreadsheet is a slicer for the store. So essentially I can use this slicer to filter the information in the pivot chart if I just want to see the information related to Computech, I can click that on the slicer and the pivot chart will update. Microworld, the pivot chart will update. And if I clear the slicers and select both of them, then I'm gonna see the data for both of them. So this slicer is linked to this pivot chart. Now what I'm trying to achieve in this video is I want to add a title to my pivot chart that says sales by store but then I want it to say which store I'm currently viewing. So if I have Computex selected in the slicer, I want the title to say sales by store Computech. If I have Microworld selected, I want it to say Microworld. And if I have both stores selected, I want to see both stores listed there. Now this isn't a particularly difficult thing to do, but there are a few steps to it. And I will say at the beginning here, this is by no means the only method you can use to do this. There are lots of other methods available out there. This is just the way that I tend to do it when I'm trying to do a dynamic chart title. Now for me, the key to all of this is in the preparation. Before we actually start to go in and start creating our formulas to create our dynamic title, I need to do some prep work first. And I always like to keep my preparation work away from my main spreadsheet that I'm working on. So what I've added down here is a new worksheet called Helper. And what I have on here is just a few little titles. I have one that says Slicer, one that says Pivot Table, one for title and one for subtitle. And this is where I'm going to do all my workings out, all of my calculations before I bring it all together on the main spreadsheet that I'm going to use. So the first step in this process is I'm going to take this slicer and I'm going to copy it. Control C. I'm going to go to my helper worksheet and I'm going to paste that slicer in and just put it underneath that slicer heading. And I'm putting this here because in a moment, once I've done my calculations, I want to test that everything works. And so I'm going to need my slicer for that. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create another little pivot table on the helper worksheet. And this is going to help me construct my formula that I'm going to use to create my chart title. So I'm going to go back to my original source data just here. I'm going to go up to table design and say summarize with pivot table. I'm going to use my data range text sales, but this time I'm going to place the pivot table on an existing worksheet and I'm going to put it on the helper worksheet. And I'm just going to place it in cell H4 and click OK. And now I have a new blank pivot table on my helper worksheet. Now I only need to have one field in my pivot table, and that's going to be the same field that I'm using in my slicer and that is the store field. So I'm going to grab the store pivot table field and I'm going to drag and drop it down into the columns area. So now I have Computech and Microworld showing in one row, which is exactly what I want for this. Now, one thing I don't need here is these grand totals. So I'm going to jump up to the design ribbon and I'm just going to turn off grand totals. 
So now that I just have Computech and Microworld listed in a row, this is what I'm going to utilize to help me build my title for my pivot chart. So this is what I would refer to as the preparation stage. Because now I've done that, I am ready to start constructing my chart title. Now, my main chart title, I'm just going to type in down here. It's going to say sales by store. And then I want it to list whether it's Computech, Microworld or both of them. And to construct this formula, I'm going to use the new text join function. Now, text join is available to Excel 2019 users. It is one of the newer functions available in Excel. If you have a version older than 2019, then you'll need to use a combination of three other functions, concatenate, substitute and trim. And I'm going to show you how that works in a moment. But first, let's concentrate on text join. So I'm going to type in the function, open my bracket. And the first argument is delimiter. So what this is basically saying is if both Computech and Microworld are selected, how do I want these words separated? Do I want them separated with a space or with a comma or with something else? Now, in my case, I want them separated with a comma space. And I need to put this in quote marks like so. Comma to move on to the next argument. My next argument is a true or false argument. And I'm going to select true here to ignore empty cells. Now, the reason why I'm selecting that option is because in the next argument, I need to select the text that I want to use in my subtitle. And my text is contained in row five. So what I'm basically saying here with that true argument is that I want Excel to ignore any empty cells in row five and close my bracket and hit enter. And there we go. Computech and Microworld are listed there with a comma space separating them. Now, at this stage, you might think that you want to test this out. So if I click on Computech on the slicer, you would hope that your subtitle is going to change just to say Computech. Now, mine hasn't, and that's because I've missed out one very important step. I need to make sure that my slicer is connected to the new pivot table that I've created. So I'm going to click on my slicer up to my slicer ribbon and click on report connections. Now in here, you could see that this slicer is already connected to the sales by category pivot table, which is the one on the other worksheet, but it's not connected to pivot table three, which is this one just here. So I'm going to put a tick in the box, click on OK. And now if I click Computech, you can see that not only does that pivot table change, but the subtitle also changes. So I can see that that formula is working correctly. Now, just as a side note for those people who are not using Excel 2019 and don't have access to that text join command, you can use the concat or concatenate if you have an even older version function in order to do this. So I'll do this very quickly. We need to concatenate our two store names. So Computech is the first one. I'm going to separate these with a space and then Microworld. Like so. So now that's producing Computech and Microworld. But what I want is a comma in the middle. So I'm going to edit my formula and I'm going to add the substitute function before the concat function. And I'm going to say replace the old text, which is the space with comma space and hit enter. So we're getting closer to what we want. We now have Computech comma Microworld, but I also have a comma at the end because there is a space there. So the final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use or add in the trim function, which trims any erroneous spaces off of words and hit enter. And there we go. And that should also work in exactly the same way. So that's the workaround if you don't have Excel 2019. So now we're at this stage. We've got all the information that we need. All we need to do now is link our titles to our pivot chart. So I'm going to jump back to sales by category. I'm going to click the text box for my chart title. I'm going to go up to the formula bar, type in equals. 
jump back to my helper worksheet and select the cell that contains the first title and hit enter. So now I have my first chart title. What I'm now going to do is insert a text box somewhere onto my chart. I'm just going to put it underneath just here. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing. Make sure I have the text box selected. Go to the formula bar and type equals. Jump back to the helper tab and click in cell B14, which contains my formula and hit enter. And there we go. It's pulled through both Computech and Microworld. Now, what I might want to do here is just a quick bit of formatting to make this look a little bit nicer. So I'm going to drag this text box out and I'm going to center the text. I might want to move it up and I might want to change the color, maybe make it bold and slightly bigger like so. You can do whatever you want with regards to formatting. But now what I should find is that if I utilize the filter on this page, if I select Computech, it changes to Computech. Microworld, I get Microworld. And if I have both selected, I can see both listed there. So with a little bit of preparation and a couple of functions, we've managed to create a really nice interactive dynamic chart title. And of course, if you don't want anyone to be able to see your helper worksheet, you can, of course, right click, select hide to hide that away. And no one is any the wiser. So that's it. That's one example of how you can utilize the text join function and slices to create dynamic pivot chart labels. I hope you find that helpful and I will see you in the next video. Hi everyone, welcome to this video tutorial on how to use the get pivot data function in Microsoft Excel. Now get pivot data is always something that I as a trainer get lots of questions about. I think people aren't really sure what it is or how to utilize it. And then when they do, they come across a few little issues. So really what I want to do in this video is just run through get pivot data, how it works, how you can toggle it off and on, and how you can get around some of those little issues that you may come across when using it. So on the screen here, I have a pivot table that I've already created. And this pivot table currently is showing the sum of profit across numerous different products for the months of the year. And what I also have next to this pivot table is another smaller table. Now, this one isn't a pivot table. You can see when I click in it, I don't get any of my pivot table utilities. But what I essentially want to do here is I want to populate both columns of this table using the pivot table data. And this is pretty much what the get pivot data function does for you. Now, just for a bit of background reference, the get pivot data function is part of the lookup and reference formulas category. And there you go. You can see it sitting in there. And it's also a function that automatically gets invoked when you try to reference data that's contained within a pivot table. So let me just start out by very quickly showing you what I mean. If I click in cell K4 and type in equals, what I want to appear in here is the sum of profit for Burlington in January. So I'm going to go across to my pivot table. I'm going to find my Burlington column and January. And if I click on this cell, you can see what I get is an extremely long get pivot data formula. So as you can see there, get pivot data is automatically invoked when Excel recognizes that you're trying to reference data in cells contained within a pivot table. So if we just read across so we understand what this formula is doing, we can see here it says profit and then it says A3. And you'll always find this in the get pivot data formula. It's going to give you first the upper leftmost cell. It's kind of like a table reference point in a way. It then goes through and looks for the product and it's pulling back Burlington and then the month name of January. And if I hit enter here, I can see if I just do a quick visual check that that number is in fact correct. So, so far, so good. Now, what I essentially want to do is complete the rest of these blank cells. 
So ordinarily, what I would normally do would be to grab my little autofill handle and drag all the way down. But look what happens when I do that. I get the same figure for each of the months, which obviously isn't correct. Now, if I dive into one of these other months, so let's double click on July and take a look at what the formula is doing, you can see it's basically exactly the same formula. It's looking for Burlington and it's also looking for January as opposed to July, which is what should be in this cell. So when I'm copying that formula down, it's not modifying anything in the formula. And this is where people start to come a cropper when using get pivot data. They're not really sure why that's happening or how you can modify that. It's actually a pretty simple problem to correct. So let's go in to our January formula again. All you need to do is replace these field names with cell references. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to change where it says product Burlington. I'm going to double click on Burlington and I'm going to replace the word with a cell reference. And I'm going to utilize the table that I'm currently working in. So I'm going to click on cell K3 because that contains the word Burlington. Now in a moment, I want to copy this down and across. So I'm going to need to do some absolute referencing here in order for that to work. So if I'm copying it across, I definitely don't want to lock the column, but I do want to lock the row. So I'm going to put my dollar symbol in front of the row only. I'm then going to do exactly the same for the month. So where we have January, I'm going to double click and I'm going to replace that with a cell reference, which in this case is J. Four. And for this one, I'm going to copy this down. So I don't want to lock the row, but I do want to lock the column. So a dollar symbol in there and hit enter. And now if I auto fill down, you can see that that's working. And if I auto fill across as well, everything here is working very nicely. So that's really all you have to do. Just replace those cell references to get everything to work. Now you might be wondering why on earth do I need to use the get pivot data function when constructing my formulas? Can't I just type in equals and then the cell reference from the pivot table and do it that way? Well, yes, you could do that and it would work. But what you'll find is that if you change the layout of your pivot table, then you're going to start to have problems. So at the moment, because I'm utilizing get pivot data, if I was to move some of these fields around in my pivot table, so let's drag product down into rows to get that layout to display differently. My figures are still working correctly. I've got all my figures in here, even though the values have changed location. Now I'm going to quickly undo out of there. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn off that get pivot data toggle and then show you what happens if you use cell references. So I'm going to delete everything out of here. Now, if you do want to turn off get pivot data, and what I mean by that is when you type equals and then reference a cell in a pivot table, you don't get that long get pivot data formula. If you want to turn that off, click in your pivot table, go up to pivot table, analyze, and in the first group here, click the options drop down and you'll see here, I've got a tick next to generate get pivot data. But what I could do is untick that and I can now utilize cell references instead. So if we go back to our table, if I type in equals, I'm looking for Burlington January, I'm going to click the cell and now I get the cell reference as opposed to the get pivot data formula. Hit enter. I can double click to auto fill this down. And as I mentioned, it does actually work. And I could do the same for Vermont. So equals, and we're going over here this time, G5. And I could then copy that down and I have my totals. So, so far, so good. The problems start to occur with this method when you start to change the layout of your pivot table. So if I go up to pivot table, analyze, Let's bring up our field list. And again, I'm going to do the same thing, drag product underneath month name. And you'll see what happens. I'm missing some figures for Burlington and I'm missing all of my figures for Vermont. And that's because the location of these values has changed. So that is the big difference between using cell references as opposed to get pivot data. I'm sure you can see get pivot data in the long run 
is a lot more beneficial as you can change the layout and the figures will still be correct. Now I've just turned Get Pivot Data back on and I've completed my table using the Get Pivot Data formula. Now one thing you need to watch out for here is that this Get Pivot Data formula will continue to work as long as you don't remove the fields from the pivot table that the formula is referring to. So my formula is referring to the product and the month name. Now, if in my pivot table, I decide to get rid of product from columns by just removing it, I'm going to get errors throughout my, because the field it's referring to is no longer there. So just bear that in mind that whilst you are free to move your field names around, and this will still work. If you actually get rid of one of them, then that formula is going to break and you'll need to redo it again. But hopefully that explains exactly what Get Pivot Data is, how you can use it, some of the pitfalls you might come across, and also how you can turn it off and work with cell references instead. That's it for this video. I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone, welcome to a new tutorial from Simon Says It. In this video, I will show you how to create a slicer in Excel. Excel is usually preferred for its ability to store and access large amounts of information. To improve user friendliness, Excel has a lot of options and functions available to help the user search, find, or retrieve data. One among them is the Excel slicer option. Excel Slicer works like a filter helping sort out information from pivot tables and Excel tables. They help filter out and point out the required information from the large repository of data and present them in an easy to read and appealing format. In this guide, I will show you how to create a slicer in Excel and how they work. There are two ways to create an Excel slicer, one from the pivot table and the other from Excel table. First, let us see how to create an Excel slicer from a pivot table. When you have a pivot table in Excel, you can create the Excel slicer using the pivot table analyze option. Under filter, click on insert slicer. This opens up an insert slicers dialog box. In the dialog box, select the elements to create slices of. You can choose one or more slices. Click OK. This creates the slices. Now you can sort the required data from the large repository of data easily. Second, let us see how to create an Excel slicer from an Excel table. To create a slice from an Excel table, go to the Insert menu. Under Filters, click on Slicer. You can also select the Insert Slicer from the Table Design menu under the Tools section. This opens up an Insert Slicers dialog box. Select the elements you want to create slices for. You can also select multiple parameters while slicing elements from the table. For example, if you want to know about the students from two cities, Buffalo and Brunswick, you can use the multi-select option to select two or more parameters from the city slice. You can clear the parameters using the clear filter option to clear all the parameters and show all the elements in the original table. This creates the slices for the Excel table where you can sort out data easily. You can customize the slice parameters using the slicer menu in the menu bar. Slicers in Excel are a great way to retrieve important information from a large set of data, resulting in lesser manual work and providing maximum efficiency. In this video, we have seen how to create an Excel slicer and how they work. Use them in the right places to ease your effort and make the data more presentable. If you have any queries, please leave your thoughts in the comments section below. We are always here to help you. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome to a new video from Simon Says It. In this video, I'll show you how to create an Excel heat map from scratch the easy way. But before we begin, let us first understand what a heat map is in the first place. 
In Excel, charts are widely used to present data in an easy to understand and visually intuitive format. The heat map is one such very popular data visualization tool. A heat map is actually a color coded table. It conveys a lot of information easily by combining a normal table with a color palette. I'm sure most of us would have come across heat maps in our daily lives. They are used in reports to draw attention to certain data points and explain them easily. Heat maps in Excel use colors to differentiate data, thus helping you get a bird's eye view of what's happening. The value in each cell of an Excel heat map has a color and it conveys some meaning. It usually ranges from dark to light color and represents the weightage of the value in the cell. But unfortunately, there is no built-in heat map tool or chart type in Excel. But that should not stop you from using this wonderful tool. That's why, in the next section, let us see how to create a heat map in Excel using conditional formatting. As the first step, enter your source data in the usual format. This will act as the base of your heat map. Ensure that all the rows and columns of your source data are properly labeled to avoid confusion. Next, select the range of cells where you wish to apply the heat map. Then, go to click on the Color Scales option under the Conditional Formatting section of the Home tab and pick any suitable color scale. In this example, the red-yellow-green color scale applies green color to lower values and red to higher values. Anything in between will get a shade of yellow mixed with green and red. There is a gradient with different shades for the three colors. If you don't want the numbers to appear in your heat map, select the numbers and press the Control plus one shortcut to open the Format Cells dialog box. There, go to the Custom category of the Number tab. Now, type three semicolons in the text box and click OK. Congratulations, you have successfully created a heat map in Excel. Sometimes you don't want a multicolor heat map and instead want a single color to be highlighted for the lower values for the sake of simplicity. To do this, go to click on the More Rules button under the Color Scale section of Conditional Formatting. Now, in the New Formatting rule box, select Two Color Scale from the Format Style drop box and set any single colors, lighter and darker hues in the minimum and maximum color pickers as per your requirements. That's it. Click OK to view your single color gradient heat map. An Excel heat map is dynamic by default since it reads the cell values and changes color accordingly. But if you notice carefully, it will not update itself if new rows of data are added. To make it truly dynamic, format your entire data as a table. You can easily do this by selecting the entire heat map, including the headers, and using the Control plus T shortcut. This way, your heat map will update automatically if newer rows of data are inserted. That's all, folks. In this video, we learned how to create a heat map using conditional formatting in five simple steps. I recommend you test this out in a practice sheet to gain better understanding. Please feel free to ask any questions in the comment section. We are always happy to help. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to a new tutorial from Simon Says It. In this video, I will show you how to create a Venn diagram in Excel. We all know how a nonverbal presentation helps in better interpretation of data. One such way to represent data is by using a Venn diagram. This type of representation is mostly used to represent the similarities and differences between one or a group of data. Creating a Venn diagram in Excel is pretty much similar to creating or customizing other graphs or charts. I will show you how to create a Venn diagram in Excel in two simple ways. First, let us see how to create a Venn diagram using SmartArt. To create a SmartArt Venn diagram, navigate to Insert. Under Illustrations, from the drop-down, click on SmartArt. This opens up a Choose a Smart Art Graphic dialog box, which shows the different templates to create a Smart Art Graphic. Click on Relationship. Scroll down and click on the Venn diagram you want to select. Clicking on the choice of your Venn diagram shows up a description for the selected graphic. Click OK. This populates the basic layout of the Venn diagram in the middle of the Excel sheet. To move the whole chart, click anywhere near the circle. This changes the mouse pointer to a four-sided pointer. 
click and drag to move the chart. If you want to resize the chart, place your mouse pointer on the anchor points. This changes the mouse pointer to a two-sided pointer. Click and drag to resize the chart. Likewise, you can move each circle and resize them. Click on the circle. Use the borderline to move the circle and use the anchor points to resize the circles. You can add text to the Venn diagram by clicking on the text places or by using the text pane. To insert text in the overlapping spaces, navigate to Insert. Under Illustrations, click the drop down from Shapes and select the text box. Left click and drag the cursor to create a text box in your preferred place. Enter your text. Though the text is added, you can see the text box is populating oddly. To remove that, right click on the text box and click on Format Shape. This opens a Format Shape pane on the right side of the Excel sheet. Under Shape Options, select No Fill in the both Fill and Line dropdowns. To add another shape, navigate to Smart Art Design. Under Create Graphic, click on Add Shape. This adds another shape to the original Venn diagram to represent the data. In case you feel like there is no need for an additional shape, you can always delete them. Just select the shape you want to delete and click on the Delete key. You can use the Smart Art Design and Format option in the main menu to add additional customizations. Another way to create a Venn diagram is by using shapes. This is a less common way to create Venn diagrams. However, this method lets you customize the Venn diagram in your favored way. To create a Venn diagram using shapes, navigate to Insert. Under Illustrations, from the Shapes dropdown, select Oval. This lets you draw any shape in any dimension depending on your preference. To create a basic three-circle Venn diagram, click, drag the mouse pointer, and create Draw Three Circles. Initially, the circles would be opaque and show no resemblance to a Venn diagram. To change them, we need to reduce their opacity. Select all three circles by holding Control, right-click on the circles, and click on Format Object. This opens up a Format Shape pane on the right side of the screen. In Shape Options, under Fill, increase or decrease the transparency of the solid fill. This gives us the required Venn diagram. You can move the chart, add text by using the above mentioned steps in the previous method. You can change the style, color, and layout of the shapes and text using the shape format option. That is all everyone. In this video, we saw how to create and customize the Venn diagram using two methods. You can use either of the methods based on your requirements. Feel free to leave any queries or thoughts in the comment section below. We are always happy to help you. Thank you. Hello everyone. Welcome to a new tutorial from Simon Says It. In this video, I will show you how to graph a function in Excel. Excel has proven to be a beneficial tool for performing various calculations. In addition to calculating the values, Excel also has the ability to provide a relationship between the input and output values in the form of graphs and charts. In this video, I will show you how to use a function and graph a function in Excel using two easy ways. Let's dive into it. In Excel, you can use the functions to establish a relationship between the input and output easily. There are two ways to use functions in Excel. First, if you are going to be operating on any mainstream function, Excel has a huge library of built-in functions you can choose from. You can just select the functions, enter the values, and Excel gives you the output. Select a cell and enter the values. Now, to add a function, click on any destination cell. Navigate to formulas in the menu bar. 
Under Function Library, you will find a variety of categories. Select the function you want to operate on. This opens up another dialog box asking you to enter the arguments for the function. You can enter any constant value. Or if you want to select or add the name of the cell in the text box and click OK. This gives the sine wave value for the given input. Now you can use the drag handle to perform the function on other cells too. Secondly, there are some functions that might not be available in the Excel function library. In such cases, you can manually create a function and get the output. Manually entering the function in Excel is very simple. Just add an equal sign before the function in the destination cell and type them. In the case of variables, select or enter the cell number to get the output. Consider the example of a quadratic equation. Enter the inputs in one column. Let it be called x. The inputs can be positive, decimal, negative, or even zero. Now enter the function in the destination cell. Always remember to add an asterisk in place of multiplication when entering functions manually. Press Enter. This gives you the output corresponding to the function and the input. You can use the drag handle to add the function to other cells and get a series of outputs. Once you have the input and output for the required function, it is fairly easy to plot a graph. To plot a graph, select the x-axis input and y-axis output of the graph. Go to the Insert menu. Under Charts, select Scatter. Click on the type of scatter chart to represent the data. This plots a graph for the function with the inputs and outputs along the x and y axes, respectively. That is all, everyone! Plotting a function in the form of a graph gives an insight into the usage of the function easily to interpret the data. In this video, we saw how to use a function and graph a function in Excel. If you have any queries, please leave your thoughts in the comments section below. We are always here to help you. Thank you. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To see the full course that this video came from, click over there. And click over there to see more videos from Simon Says It.